and welcome to the paranormal portal i'm your host brent thomas and we are live and unrehearsed right here on this fine wednesday evening it's hump day and i'm not alone here i've got uh my good friend my co-host the big toe himself is here mr don longbeard that's the long beard not big toe you are the big toe though <laughs> you give me balance don you keep me balanced <laughs> You oh keep me standing, Don. Actually, I don't know how that is, because I try to tip this thing over every night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay, because we operate on our sides just as well, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know <laughs> exactly what that means, but that's all I had. Let's just leave that one there. <laughs> we can leave that one. So, <laughs> we have so other there. more important things to get to. Yeah, this is already going downhill. But I guess, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we've got nothing but uphill ahead. Or, 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 or I don't know, what's the uphill is good, right? Or is it downhill the good when you're gliding, or is it well, uphill? You know, when, you know, the, the problem with being fat is you only roll one way. You either roll up or down, and it's usually down. We got some gravity kicking in then, and that's, that's what I'll put it. Because joining us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a, a second-time guest here on the Paranormal yes. Portal. And we are joined by none other than Mr. Vic Cundiff, host of Dogman Encounters Radio, My Bigfoot Sighting, My Paranormal Experience, and Bigfoot Eyewitness. Witness. My goodness, he sounds like us. I know, our man <laughs> is busy, but uh, I, I don't know. We're just honored to have him back, and uh, thanks for being here, Vic. It's great to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here as well. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure, man. Uh, it's been a long time, and I'm sorry it took so long to get you back on. It's just, uh, uh, well, COVID happened and everything yeah. else happened. <laughs> crazy, yeah, crazy. It, it's happened. been crazy in, in our own lives and in the show, and but uh, we're thrilled to get you back here because, uh, you know, I know that one of the most popular topics that we discuss here on the show is, is the cryptids. Uh, you know, I mean, that we have a, a very motivated audience when it comes to cryptids. And I, I know that the last time you're on the show, people are like, hey, you got to get Vic back. That was a great show. And, and so here you are. And how's things going for you, first of all? Well, I'm busy as sin. <laughs> Keeping up with four shows, the production of four shows. Yeah, it's. It'll run you ragged, but that's what I signed up for. So yeah, yeah, I guess that's what I, that's exactly right there. What I should expect. <laughs> so what made you dive into two more shows? I mean, cause that is really a, a Herculean undertaking for sure. Well, I've always had a, a very strong interest in cryptids and 
with dog men that kind of speaks for itself. I do that mainly to help the dog men eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. I happen to have a show where I feature eyewitnesses coming on and talking about their dog man experiences, but the main purpose of dog man encounters is to help the dog man eyewitnesses cope with their experiences and come to terms with them. But as mm -hmm. far as the Bigfoot side, the other cryptid side and paranormal side with my pair of X, yeah, yeah, that's just more of an interest I've been delving into. It's always been interesting to me to listen to Bigfoot encounters. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to put platforms out there where people can come on and share their experiences that they've had with Sasquatch for my Bigfoot sighting and Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio. Then, of course, on the other side, my pair of X. There have been so many people over the years who have contacted me with experiences that didn't fit into the category of a Sasquatch encounter or a dogman encounter. And there's been a lot of interest, it would seem, over the years for me to offer a platform where eyewitnesses, experiencers could come on and talk about experiences they've had with the paranormal, whether that might be ghost encounters, strange cryptid encounters, you name it. So that's yeah. why I host these or I produce these four shows. Yeah, I think it's really cool. And I don't think a lot of people know that that you do work a lot with the people that are on your shows in, in terms of especially the dogman encounters, um, helping them work through the experiences. And I, I, I was blown away when I first heard that too, because a lot of times, you know, and I'm guilty of this as well. I mean, it's, it's easy to take these, these stories and just, you know, showcase them to the world because they're interesting and exciting. But on the other side of that are people that oftentimes are really damaged and traumatized by these things. So I thought it was really admirable that you, you've taken it a step further and, and tried to help them piece it all back together. Well, thanks for saying that, but you're giving me too much credit. Number one, I only offer help to dogman eyewitnesses when it comes to dealing with their encounters and coming to terms with their experiences. As far as Sasquatch eyewitnesses go, other paranormal experiencers go, I don't offer a helping hand to them to try and help them cope with their experiences personally. Now, when people reach out to me who have had paranormal experiences that they need help with, there was a uh, gentleman who has been on the two latest episodes of My Paranormal Experience whose mother lives in a house that's extremely haunted, a really creepy place. Well, she doesn't have the means to move, so the poor thing is trapped there, basically. Oh, yeah. Well. I don't know nearly enough about paranormal phenomena, period, to be able to offer any help. I don't have the time even to help her. So what I did was I put her into contact with a researcher, a paranormal researcher, who does know what he's talking about when it comes to these things. And I did that in hopes that he actually can help her deal with what she's dealing with. But, yeah, like I said, the dogmen eyewitnesses, those are the only ones that I actually set time aside to try and help cope with their experiences so it's it's only with them that i do that right sure but i mean that's that's awesome and i i, I think it's it's desperately mean desperately needed because i think when these people and i it, when i think of all the cryptid experiences of course to me just uh, just anecdotally hearing these different claims of what people are running into I think the most fearsome would be the dog man. I mean, they are just up in your face and, and, and they, they have real boundary issues. Uh, they have no problem coming up and, and just making you uh, want to crawl out of your skin from the sounds of it. Oh, definitely. Well, I'll take it one step further. Mm -hmm. They, it's not a matter of them not having a problem doing that. They seem to relish doing that. Mm -hmm. Not all dog men, of course, but. More than enough do seem to relish it. They'll come up, force the encounter to happen, and terrorize these people. And, yeah, it, it does leave quite the mess. When you have an experience with something like that that can be 10, 11, 12 feet tall, mm -hmm. looks like a, a werewolf that's in your face in some cases, and doing its best to terrorize you, then, yeah, that does make it very difficult to deal with. Yeah, that's a that's a paradigm shifter for sure. Um, I have to ask you because I, I of all the all the cryptids, well, there's several I, I can't claim to know a ton about, but the dogman uh, seems to be, in a lot of respects, hard to differentiate. Well, for me on the outside looking in, it seems hard to differentiate sometimes. 
in the activity of a dogman uh, encounter versus uh, outside of visual, but just in the just in the, like some of the intimidation tactics seem, um, well, I, I'm just again I'm paraphrasing, but they seem very much in line with a lot of Bigfoot uh, encounters. So how do you differentiate that uh, if it wasn't a visual confirmation? Well, I only deal with people who have actually laid eyes on okay. a dogman or dogman plural. I have people who have contacted me. They heard a strange sound in the woods. It's got to be a dogman. It's got to be a dogman. Well, mm. if you didn't see it, it could have been something else. It could have been a raccoon. It could have been something else. So unless you actually saw the dogman, okay. saw a dogman or dogmen, and there's actually a little note on the website on dogmanencounters.com when someone goes to submit a form, a report about a sighting, there is a notation there that lets them know, please only submit this report if you actually laid eyes on a dogman. Mm. So that's an attempt to preclude the, the situations where you have someone who heard something they think might have been a dogman. Okay. So, yeah, that's what's behind all that. And do you know, do you, do you find that they have, um, behaviorally, do they have quite a range much like the Sasquatch? Cause you know, there's a lot of Sasquatch encounters where it's just like, oh, you're there and they wander off. And then there's the ones where they're chasing them through the woods and shadowing them and, and intimidating the hell out of them. So do you find that there's a, a that same personality barometer within the dog man as well? Well, Sasquatch definitely seemed to display a lot more culture. You might find them building stick structures and, and hanging out with other Sasquatch and doing various things to occupy their time. Whereas dogmen, they're either seen hunting or drinking or they're basically causing an encounter to happen. They stick more to the basics than what Sasquatch do. So you will find... On occasion, you'll find dogmen watching a person, just observing, not forcing an encounter to happen. The eyewitness just happens to notice them off in the distance. But normally, when people have sightings, it's much more direct and mm -hmm. confrontational than with a Sasquatch. Oh, that's interesting. So are there reports of them being a, a pack or tribe kind of animal, or are they most, most often solitary? Well, understand, Sasquatch have an advantage that dogmen don't. Sasquatch are omnivores. They can mm. make their living out there in the woods by subsisting on vegetation mm. and meat, or a combination of both. Dogmen, they're almost exclusively obligate carnivores. Oh. So it's a lot more difficult for them to make their living in certain places where a Sasquatch could. It just depends on the meat supply for dogmen. Now, you'll have people who swear up and down that they can do just fine subsisting on apples and vegetation, you name it. But when you look at them, every anatomical feature in a dog man points solely to the fact that they're obligate carnivores. Mm -hmm. So I would have to actually see that to believe that they do like to eat grapes and apples, other vegetation, leaves, you name it. But, yeah... With that in mind, it would be a lot easier for a group of Sasquatch to exist in an area together than it would be for dogmen. If you think about the caloric requirements on a daily basis right. that a right. 10, 11, 12-foot tall dogman would have, right. I can only guess what that must be. But if you have more than one of those guys in a particular mm -hmm. area, it wouldn't sure. take long at all to deplete the sources, the resources in that area. So it just wouldn't make sense for them to hang out in numbers for any period of time, if at all. I'm not going to say that it never happens because, yes, I have spoken with eyewitnesses, credible eyewitnesses, who reported to me that they did see a number of them together. But right, right. I think that's the exception rather than the rule. Right. Hey, Vic, so you, you've mentioned the, the – the, we, we talked – you just mentioned about them being obligate carnivores. Um, and you talked about them being like, you know, 10, 12 foot sometimes. Now, you, you, last time you were on, you mentioned something about their mass and how the mass doubles per. Can you go over that again to give people idea of how much, you know, how big these things are, that they actually need all these calories and this content, this protein and stuff? Sure. I sure can. Yeah, what you're referring to is called square cube law. Yes. Square cube law 
is a scientific principle that states if you double the size of an object, as long as you keep that object in proportion to its original size, then its weight is going to multiply by a factor of eight. To spell that out, to make it easy to understand, if you use cubes that are one feet wide or one foot wide by one foot tall by one foot front to back and to keep this simple let's say that cube that's one foot by one foot by one foot weighs 10 pounds all right if you wanted to double the size of that cube that means it would have to be two feet tall by two feet wide by two feet front to back well we could build that two foot by two foot cube using one foot by one foot by one foot cubes just by placing them side by side and stacking them. Okay, let's do the numbers to calculate how many of those 10 pound one foot by one foot by one foot cubes it would take to build a two foot by two foot by two foot cube structure. You would have eight. You would have a structure that's two of those blocks wide, two of those blocks front to back, two of those blocks tall. That's mm -hmm. eight. Four in the bottom, four in the top. Well, that means that if you multiply that number by, uh, let's see, what, 10 pounds, I said. I think I said 10 pounds per cube. Mm -hmm. If you multiply 10 times 8, you're looking at 80. Yeah. So, yeah, it's easy to calculate how much the weight would increase of an object if you double its size and keep its proportions the same. So that's basically what square cube law is all about. Right. Some people have tried to say, people who didn't understand that principle have tried to say it's nonsense, but it even works in the animal kingdom, basically. If you think about a Great Dane, there are Great Danes that do stand 36 inches at the withers, at the shoulder. Well, that's a pretty big Great Dane. If you took a big male Great Dane that was about 36 inches at the withers, at the shoulders, it's not uncommon for him to weigh about 200 pounds. Well, if you want to double his size, Great Danes are very close in proportion to horses. If you double his size, then that means he's going to be six feet at the withers. Well, guess what kind of horse comes in at roughly about six feet or so at the withers? A Clydesdale. A well, you're close. A light draft horse. Yeah, a light draft horse. Mm. Like a Frisian. Right. Well, if you, ha if you take a Frisian that's six feet at the withers, it's not uncommon for that Frisian to weigh, guess how much? 1,600 pounds. Well, guess what 200 times 8 is? Right. Sure. Okay. It applies. It applies in the animal kingdom. That's a perfect example to spell that out. Now, some people will say, well, I've got a son who's three feet tall, and I'm 200 pounds. I don't know what 200 divided by 8 is, but the last time someone tried to shoot that example down of square cube law, they used that example, why it supposedly doesn't work. Well, kids don't have the same proportions that oh, adults sure. do. Right. Sure. Their heads are proportionally larger than a human adult's head would be. Their arms are proportionally shorter. Their legs are shorter. So, yeah, in a lot of ways, kids do not have the same proportions that an adult would have. Look at the width of their shoulders. The width of their shoulders, in a lot of cases, is that much wider than how wide their head is. That's definitely not the case with an adult. So, yeah, that doesn't dispel the law in any way, but that's what square cube law, square cube law, basically says. Now let's take this over and use it in the world of Sasquatch, for example. If you have a 12 foot tall Sasquatch, they're going to be proportionally wider than a six foot tall man. Right. They're going to be proportionally thicker front to back than a six foot tall man. So these people who estimate Sasquatch, he was 12 feet tall and he was, I'd say he was 800 pounds. You can understand <laughs> now how that's just totally off. Mm -hmm. That Sasquatch, if he's 12 feet tall, he would have to be, if you take a, a six foot man that's on average 200 pounds, multiply that by eight, well, that gives you 1,600 pounds. But remember that Sasquatch is double the height of that six foot man is not in proportion to what that six-foot man would have been if he doubled his size. No, that Sasquatch is wider than that man would be if he was 
suddenly blown up to be the size of uh, the height of 12 feet, this Sasquatch is proportionally wider, is proportionally thicker front to back. So that would mean that Sasquatch that's coming in at about 12 feet would have to weigh even more than 1,600 pounds. That's why I say, I've said this for a long time, that people, they really underestimate the weight of a lot of these Sasquatch they see. They underestimate the weight of these dogmen they see. And it's because of square cube law right. that I support that statement. Absolutely. You know, and so that gives you the perfect, uh, you know, the perfect idea of, you know, how big and how much mass these things have. And, and of course, with that also, you know, you've got to realize how much they're going to eat, you know. So, you know, when, when people say, yeah, Sasquatch, you know, reached over my chicken coop and pulled out three or four chickens, you know, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's a light snack. <laughs> well yeah yeah definitely yeah that's that's crazy and then it also helps to explain how as as a lot of people are casting tracks you know you see them like oh putting their foot next to it and then they they stomp to try to get some depth and they're really not able to penetrate but here is this this impression that's two and a half inches right. deep or two inches deep right. into this really strong uh substrata or, or whatever and and that would require an impressive load in order to press down like that. Right. So I think it's, it's, you're absolutely right as far as I can tell. I mean, I'm obviously no expert, but that makes perfect sense to me because when you hear, I saw an eight-foot Sasquatch, must have been 400 pounds. Ah. <laughs> like, what, what? Was he a basketball player? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And another thing that drives home that point is being valid is, how many times have you heard a researcher talk about finding a huge print? And to try and get an idea of the weight, they would jump up and down on the yes. dirt and yeah. on the ground to try and see how deep their print went into the ground compared to that Sasquatch print. And they couldn't do it. Right. Well, if you think about the fact that that Sasquatch print is occupying so much more area than your print, that tells you that that Sasquatch would proportionally have to be that much heavier yet to yeah. be able to push the ground down as far as it did. So that's another reason why I say people just, they grotesquely underestimate the weight of these guys. Right. Sure. And, you know, granted, we're not used to seeing eight-foot-tall hominid <laughs> primates or whatever. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if they would correctly estimate the weight of a gorilla, you know, right. for that matter. So that stands to reason. But I think it, it really does uh, illustrate how much bigger these things are, how much more powerful they are than, than us. Now, you've been, you've been talking about the dogman, you're saying tw 10, 12 feet. Wow. Is, is that a common size? Because that's enormous. No, thank goodness it's not. Okay. Or maybe I should say, unfortunately, it's not. Because <laughs> if I had to pick between a supersized dogman like that, a one that's six, seven feet tall, that I had to have an encounter with. I'd pick the big one every time because mm -hmm. you're much more likely to have trouble with a smaller dog man than you are a larger one. When people oh, run into yeah. the really big ones, yeah, true. they show much more restraint than the smaller ones do. Oh. But that's because of maturity, in my opinion. Oh. Once they get to be that size, you're talking about a fully mature dog man that has no interest in nonsense and normally have a behavior pattern that's kind of like one of those dry... When you were growing up, I guess all of us had friends where their parents were no nonsense. There was no joking around. It's all strictly business. That's kind of the mindset that most of these really big dog men seem to have. Okay, well, you bumped into me. There you are. I don't want to be bothered by you. Right. Keep moving. Sure. But the small ones, they'll actually normally seek you out. Oof. The small ones, I should say, I should correct myself, they're more likely to seek out an encounter and enforce mm -hmm. an encounter to happen. So the big ones, they're not. Sometimes they do, but not nearly as often as the small ones do. Mm. So do you think that's kind of like a juvenile counting coup kind of thing? Well, if you think about it, you're talking about apex predators <laughs> who have no trouble whatsoever feeding themselves. If you think mountain lions, you know the moniker that, you know the appellation, I should say, that, mon that mountain lions have, a.k.a. the deer killing machines out there well if you think mountain lions are impressive when it comes to taking out deer that's nothing compared to how easily these guys can take yeah. deer out yeah. well 
And that means that they don't expend very much energy taking out deer to feed themselves. It doesn't take much time out of their day. So what are they going to do with the rest of the time in the day? I think it's a favorite pastime for, of theirs to terrorize us. I think that's why they do that for the most part. Now, if we can kind of head off onto a tangent, I don't want to to go in a different direction than you guys want to go. I'm going to ask you this. One of the things that's talked about in the dogman world a lot is how dangerous dogmen are. Mm -hmm. Would you mind if I addressed something in that direction? Please, yeah. Oh, the floor absolutely. is yours, brother. Yep. Absolutely. <sighs> okay, we'll get comfy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I've been doing this, there have been countless messages coming in telling me, well, Vic, you say that dogmen aren't dangerous that dogmen aren't wired to be aggressive and attack people, but you're wrong. The people who were attacked and killed, they can't come forward and share their experience. And that's true. Mm -hmm. If someone's attacked and killed by a dogman, they can't come forward and share that experience. But understand, I'll never say that dogmen are safe to be around. Right. I'll tell an eyewitness who, through the actions of the dogman they encountered, it showed to them that it showed them that it was not interested in harming them or killing them. It demonstrated with its own actions, all it wanted to do was just terrify them to within an inch of their life. And then once they could see that that was done, it moved on. But what I say to these people, or what I would say to these people who are of the mindset that dogmen are wired to be dangerous killing machines that'll rip you apart as soon as look at you is this. I spoke with my first dogman I witnessed in 2007. And since then, for a long time, it's been to the point where I don't even bat an eye if I have three, four brand new dogman I witnesses who I've never heard from before contact me in one day to let me know about their encounter or encounters that they've had. And sometimes it gets so crazy, I have seven or eight brand new encounters coming in in one day. Again, from people, eyewitnesses, I've never heard from before. Well, when you look at the numbers of people I've spoken with over the years about their dogman encounters, that represents a, a very big number, a huge number. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken with over the years about their encounters, but that number is huge. And with that in mind, if you polled all these people that I spoke with about their dogmen encounters and asked them, okay, how many of you ever were attacked by the dogmen or dogmen you encountered? Over the years I've been doing this, there have been six, seven credible eyewitnesses. Six or seven of them, credible eyewitnesses, who have come forward and told me about being attacked by the dogmen they encountered. Wow. Well, that's going to make you real. It's going to make you cringe because, yeah, you think, ooh, six, seven dogman attacks. Wow. Yeah, that's terrifying. And it is. But let's look at the big picture here. If you polled that same number of people who've had direct interactions with horses, let's say you got thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have interacted with horses sure. and polled them to ask them, Okay, how many of you have ever been attacked by a horse that you interacted with? You know full well that that number would be in the hundreds. Hundreds of them, if you poll thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who have dealt with horses, hundreds of them would say, yes, I've been kicked or I was stomped on, I was bitten, you name it. Hundreds of them would say that. Okay, you swap horses out for any animal out there, camels, pigs, goats. That number, again, would be in the hundreds if you polled thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them. The fact that when it comes to dogmen, if you polled all those eyewitnesses, that you would only get six or seven credible eyewitnesses coming forward to tell you, yes, I was attacked, that tells you right there that dogmen show a remarkable amount of restraint they show a lot more restraint to when it comes to becoming violent with humans than dogs and mm. house cats and horses, camels, pigs, you name it. So that right there is one good way to show that they're not nearly as dangerous as a lot of people make them out to be. Another great way to illustrate that point is... If you spoke with an entomologist, obviously an entomologist 
specializes in studying, studying insects. Well, if you spoke with an entomologist who specialized in studying fire ants, if they had been doing that for any period of time, you know they would have spoken with who knows how many people who unfortunately had the experience of encountering fire ants. Mm -hmm. Well, with that in mind, you tell me, how many times do you think they would have ever had the conversation, a conversation that went like this? Well, the other day I was running around the backyard barefoot and shorts and a t-shirt with the kids, just running around, playing with them, having a great time. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going and wound up tripping and falling right onto a fire ant mound. Mm -hmm. Well, when I realized what I had done, like an idiot, I jumped <laughs> up and I started brushing them off my arms and off my legs. They were up under my shirt, too. I brushed them all off of me, thank goodness, without suffering so much as a single sting. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell me, how many times do you think that entomologist would have ever had those words said to them? <laughs> I'm thinking probably none. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And why is that? That's because... Fire ants are not wired that way. If they have the opportunity, especially if they're on your arms, on your legs, they're going to light you up because yeah. they're wired to be aggressive, extremely aggressive. If opportunity presents itself, they're going to light you up. Well, if dogmen were so dangerous the way so many of these people make them out to be, then you wouldn't have me over the years talking with all these eyewitnesses Right. Who knows how many dogmen eyewitnesses who were caught dead to rights in very compromising situations, but allowed to leave without so much as a scratch. They were allowed to leave clearly because the dogman did not want to harm them. Mm -hmm. That right there tells us that they are not wired to be extremely aggressive and dangerous. They're not wired to rip your head off as soon as the opportunity presents itself. Because if that was the case, then we wouldn't have these numbers, the who knows how many dogmen eyewitnesses I've spoken with over the years who, like I said, were caught dead to rights and the dogman could have done whatever it wanted to do to them. I'm not saying that some people haven't been attacked by them and killed. Of course they have. Mm. I'll never say that. Any critter out there with teeth and or claws, if you push wrong buttons, it just might attack. I mean, I've spoken with People who have told me, you see that white and brown rabbit right over there, Vic? Well, yeah, I do. I see him. Well, about a month ago, a lady picked him up and stroked his fur against the green. And when she did that, he attacked her. Does that mean that rabbits are bloodthirsty, mindless, monstrous, <laughs> killing machines? No. It just means that if a critter has teeth and or claws, if you push the wrong buttons, then it just might attack. Sure. So, yeah, why should dogmen be any different? That is when you look at how dangerous these guys are, that is at the root of the reason why I tell people, look, the evidence clearly points to the fact that they are not wired to mm -hmm. be extremely dangerous. There are, just like in any animal out there, there are examples of whatever animal species where you've got a dangerous specimen. I mean, sure. there are dangerous people, dangerous dogs, dangerous horses, so why should dogmen be any different that way either? Of course, you have dangerous dogmen who, as soon as the opportunity presents itself, they will attack. But as a whole, yeah, they're not normally wired to be that way. That's why I, I take exception to the idea that these guys are bloodthirsty, mindless killing machines that so many shows try to make them out to be. That's just trying to put butts in seats and yeah, the fright thing sells, but when it boils down to the, the truth of the matter, that's not how they are. Sure, and that makes sense, because if they were, you'd have a lot less people talking about their experiences. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> there wouldn't be anybody left. Yeah. Now, i got to ask you have, you, have you, have you been able to ascertain from any of those people that were attacked the, uh, of anything that they did that might have provoked it, or is there any anything sticking out, or was it just a, a different experience for whatever reason well nothing from the details they shared with me stuck out as a clear trigger to cause the attacks okay. but that doesn't mean that maybe they did do something unknowingly that sure. triggered it i don't know yeah but i can't share the particulars of sure. what happened but i don't i can't think of anything that they told me that that made me think okay yeah that's what caused the attack to happen mm, very interesting um do you mind taking a call 
Not at all. Okay, we got someone on the horn here, so I want to just get them in. And oh, this you is know exactly this is Android, is. one of our mods, <laughs> and he's got a question. Are you there, Android? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear him, Vic? All right. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Go ahead, Android. Perfect. Thanks for taking the call. Before I ask the question, I'm just going to ask if you've heard of it, so I know how to focus uh, the question or not. Have you heard of the book um, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon? No, I haven't. I'm sure you've probably heard of Skinwalker Ranch. It's basically written by a doctor and some other people who did investigations at the Skinwalker Ranch about these contractors who did the investigation next. And there is a report in that book. I had just recently heard this um, on a podcast where he was sharing some information about his book. And when they had returned from investigating on Skinwalker Ranch, um, the family members, his wife, not actually his wife, but one of the other investigators, their wife and their son on two separate occasions saw, after he had returned from the investigation, a dog man on the wood line in their backyard peering at them. The wife never brought it up. Then, I don't know, days or weeks later, the son saw one peering on the inside of the window. And now this blew my mind because this happened after they investigated the Skidwalker Ranch, almost as if it was like a PSYOPs mission, as if this dog man was sent to scare them away from returning from them. Do you think that these things have any intelligence, like on a level of human? Oh, I do. Yeah, I think they're at least as intelligent as humans are. Yeah, I, I recommend looking into that book. I'm, I'm definitely going to buy that book because it, it totally blew my mind to hear a, a PhD biologist talking about this who did government contracting work in the Skinner Walker Ranch. It just blew my mind. Yeah, that's really wild. Wow, that is. Yeah, yeah. It was co-authored, co-authored by George Knapp as well. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there's there's a name there that we all know. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yep. Fantastic. Well, yeah, th- his name is yeah, his name is uh, Dr. Uh, Calm Kellinger, I believe. It's, okay. it's the gentleman who was on the podcast Cole, Cole who Killinger. was talking about this. Yep. Yeah. Wow. What you just mentioned yep. about the dog man coming in and peering into their home and try to use it tried to use intimidation techniques. Yeah, that's not an isolated incident. That happens not all that commonly, but it does happen more than what you would expect. I don't know how they do it. I really don't. It just makes you wonder. I'll never say that these guys are strictly flesh and blood. I'll never say that they have to be ethereal. If you do this for any period of time, you're going to bounce back and forth between being convinced on one hand they must be ethereal. And then the next moment, you're convinced they have to be flesh and blood. I don't know for sure what they are. I can make good arguments both ways, but yeah, I'd only be lying if I told you that I definitively knew which category they fell into. They fell into because, yeah, I just don't know on that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely very fascinating. It just blew my mind on multiple levels to hear a PhD biologist talk about this who did government contracting work, and and it wasn't even just him reporting it; it's just family members of another government contractor who have no benefit of sharing this. They're just family members. They made no money off of this report. And it just was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm definitely buying that book now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It's really a shame that happened, but these guys, they will follow you home. So, yeah, don't start none. There won't be none in a lot of cases. <laughs> but, yeah, if you go, for an example, there was a researcher, a dogman researcher, contacted me a while ago all upset because he was researching dog men, and now you've got to help me, Vic. You've got to help me. One followed me home. Mm. What do I do? What do I do? Well, I tell people, be careful what you ask for. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're going to go into the area and try to research them, be sure that you're willing to accept the possible fallout, that they might follow you home the way he found out the hard way. And then he came to me asking for help, begging for help. So, yeah, this is not a game. 
This isn't fun in games. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, these guys think, ruin people's I think, lives. I think the family also lived on the East Coast. And, you know, Skinwalker Ranch is, like, on the West Coast. So it really is amazing that that had happened, right? Not Within a month or two of them returning home, and uh, almost as if, you know, did it travel all that way if it's a physical entity or just, you know, almost like it was sent there to, to interrogate or, you know, intimidate them to not return. And, and okay, okay, if that was done, who sent them, you know? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, there's a lot of questions. Yeah. Wow. Well, I appreciate it. Go ahead, Android. Yeah, I was going to say, I just appreciate your insight on it because I just thought it was fascinating. Literally just heard that two nights ago. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it's a lot to wrap your mind around. <laughs> and thanks for calling, Android. It's good to hear from you, brother. Thanks for calling in. All right. Thanks, fellas. Have a good night. All right. Good night. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's amazing. Now, uh, are there any any reports, uh, and maybe we covered this when you were here last time, but I don't remember. Are there any reports regarding uh, speed at which these these animals or these beings can travel? Well... I have heard cases where people were driving down the road at roughly 60 miles an hour, mm -hmm. possibly close to 70, and were being paced by dogmen. Oh, I don't know if that really happened or not, but they sounded credible, so it does make you wonder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard, uh, I've, I've heard of some pretty impressive numbers around Bigfoot, too. Um, there was... Well, yeah, one of our friends, one of our close friends, Cindy, says that they're 40, 45 miles an hour. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, that's fast enough. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say, but, man, I don't know. These things move quicker than we do, that's for sure. I mean, and that's another thing. If, we, if they really were geared towards violence, then everybody that came into their zone would just be dead. Yeah, There's well, just no way. Well, that's like the exactly. last time. Yeah, like like the last time Vic was on, he said, you know, somebody said, "Oh yeah, I ran around that dog dog man." And Vic's <laughs> like, "No, you didn't." <laughs> oh yeah, I ran all three hundred yards. I've mm -hmm. always been a super fast runner. Mm -hmm. In fact, back in college, I ran track. And yeah, that day I outran that dog man all three hundred <laughs> yards back to the S10. Every time I looked over my shoulder, every time I glanced, of course, he was six feet behind me. But luckily, I was able to out. <laughs> run them all the way back to the S10. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> no, I don't think Oh, my gosh. <laughs> not, not in this no, world, anyway. No way. <laughs> and you're talking about a poor guy who had a lot of trouble sleeping for the past, what, I guess 12 years, 10, 12 years since that happened, all because of the trauma taking him off his game so much that he was unable to see what really happened that day for what it was. He was being toyed with. Yeah. And that's a huge difference. If you're being toyed with versus running from, from a dog man, running for your life and saving yourself from this bloodthirsty, <laughs> mindless, monstrous killing machine that wants to rip you apart, there's a huge difference between those two examples. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just basically, it's basically making these eyewitnesses realize the true nature of these experiences they've been having. In a lot of cases, they've been looking at what happened in a way that's just totally wrong. So, yeah, just like in his case, making sure he understood that, no, you did not run that dog man all 300 <laughs> yards back to the truck. When you first started out, he was six feet behind you when you were getting up to speed. You got up to speed, and he was Oh, six feet behind me still. Imagine that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and and how did he get in the in the, the vehicle with only six feet to go? Well, when he got to the truck, he was so terrorized that his heart sank because he realized his keys were in his pocket. So he had to run laps around the truck while trying to fish the keys out of his pocket. Oh, no. Oh, no. All the while doing the dosy -si do trying to make sure the dog man didn't catch him. And you know, you tell him, understand. It was an S10. Right. It could have just jumped over the bed yeah. and got you if it wanted to, right. or it could have just run you down. It could have gotten around that truck quicker than you could have, and <laughs> it could have grabbed you that way, but you were allowed to stop, right. put the key in the lock, open up, unlock the door, open up the door, dive in when you got away from it. <laughs> you were allowed to do that because it wanted to just terrorize you. It did not want to rip you apart. So, yeah, I mean, right. that right there is exactly what happened. You just need to focus on what really happened that day instead of allowing your human nature right. to cause it to be something it's your 
hubris. to cause you to see it as something totally different than what happened. Right. Yeah, that's wow. your hubris kicking in. It's like, yeah, you know, we're we're apex predators ourselves. That's <laughs> what that is. So yeah. Psychologically he just needed that win. Well, you know, and maybe that's what helped him through his encounter, yeah, you know, just maybe. Uh, you know, that might have been it, you know. Wow. That's that's Yeah, just uh just uh here and there sixty six said they would have just flipped the truck if they wanted to. And I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Are they also uh is are they on scale of strength uh, what we understand Sasquatch to be, Vic? Oh my goodness, I can imagine so. They do some freaky things. Some freakish displays of strength. I, I mean, tipping over RVs and things like that. Not the motorhomes, but the travel trailers and all. Just things that require a tremendous amount of strength. So, yeah, if they're not on par with a Sasquatch strength-wise, they can't be all that far behind. Yeah, no, that's that's huge. Wow. Yeah. I, just, I can't imagine a worse sight than thinking you're going to die and looking over your shoulder and six feet away is death. And you keep running and it's still six feet away. Oh my all the way around the car. <laughs> I, there would have been a huge fudge stripe all on that whole prairie for me. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> that Steven would, Coilers. Yeah, I would have been, been laying a trail. That's all I can tell you. Um, we got another caller, Vic, if you don't mind. No, by all means. Okay, let's get this one on. Area code 480, you're on the air. Hi, this is Jess. Hi, I just Jess. told Don the news. I'm coming to Phenomicon to meet you. Yep, oh, sure phenomenal. Yep. Phenomenal. See what I did there? Yep, ah. I, on, on, on my birthday. Nice. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. That'll be fun. I can't wait to get that bumper sticker. <laughs> Which oh, one? Oh, yeah. From... from, from I don't know. From, from, you bring in a bump, bumper stickers and stuff? Are we? We, I guess we could be. I don't know. We haven't really talked about what we're bringing, <laughs> really? but but that's not a bad idea, Jess. I think we're going to look into that. Thank you for that idea. Sweet. Because <laughs> I've been wanting a bumper sticker, and I want to meet you guys. Well, and I'm going, I, I can't wait to meet you. Fantastic. I, I, I can't understand why. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gee. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Aww. And I do have a question for Vic. Yes, please. Um, do, does, do you um, study, besides Dogman and Bigfoot, any other cryptids? Well, see, that's the thing. I don't study Dogman. What I know about Dogman is just due to oh, okay. being exposed to it over the years and talking with so many eyewitnesses. Oh, okay. And whatnot. As far as Sasquatch goes, yeah, I'll listen to Sasquatch based podcasts when I'm laying, staring at the ceiling in the middle of the night, enjoying my insomnia and all that. But yeah, I don't listen to Dogmia podcasts. That's not entertainment for me. Mm. So yeah, Sasquatch, no, that is I'm just curious if there's any other cryptids you um, are interested in besides Bigfoot and Dogman, too. <laughs> Well, I like to listen to stories about anything that goes bump in the night, but, yeah, I don't sit and listen to oh, yeah. anything Dogman related. But, yeah, not, I don't study anything. I don't study Sasquatch. Okay. I don't study any of them, though. Hmm. Good question. Yeah. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah. Oh, sure, no problem. All right. All right. Well, thanks for calling in, Jess. It's yeah. great to hear from you, and we'll yeah, look absolutely. forward to meeting you at Phenomicon. On my birthday. Awesome. On your birthday. We won't forget. 29 forever. <laughs> 29. Happy, happy 29. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, sure, sure, Don. <laughs> All right. All right, Jess. Thanks for calling in. All right. Take care. See Bye. Ya. Now, Vic, what would, the, what, what would an, uh, uh, let's say, the average dog man print, would that look like yeah. an oversized wolf print, or would it look more like... Uh, a footprint uh, that like we have with talons on the end or what would we, what could you expect to find in a dog man print? Well, most of the prints that are found do look like a giant dog print or a giant wolf print because most of the eyewitnesses who report having dog man encounters report seeing canine type dog men, okay. the ones with stifled joints instead of knees and they have hots instead of heels so, yeah, you can't have a heel on the ground if this specimen has a hock sticking oh, up sure. in the air. Okay. What's it going to have? Double heels on each <laughs> leg? Yeah, it's not going to happen. Probably so, not. yeah, 
it goes without saying that, yeah, most of the prints that are found do represent giant canid prints. But there are all sorts of funky prints that are found. Prints that are clearly made by something walking digitigrade with claws on its toes, type 3, some people say googways. But, yeah, the, the prints run the gamut. I've seen some really funky-looking prints that I think were genuine. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, there's not just one way that they can look. Wow. Okay. That's cool. Because oftentimes we, we, you know, we, I've seen people taking pictures of, of what look like large canine mm-hmm. prints. I, I, I really am not sure of scale, but they're like, I think a dog man might be in the area. And I was like, well, I wonder what is it an identifiable factor of a dog man? But if it's just a, a canine print, but very large, then I guess that would be very identifiable. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, there's a picture on the internet. If you Google dogman print, there's a picture that should pop up where you can see a, a giant canid print with a red shotgun shell in the middle of the print for scale. That's a good way to, to find a dogman print if you haven't seen one. I'm actually looking now. Um, I should put track, not print, because I'm getting, <laughs> getting a bunch of posters popping up. Yep. Dogman track. Let's see what happens with the red shotgun shell. There's some in the snow. Um, let me know if you see it, Don. Yep, I'm looking. I'm scanning here because I, I would love for us to be able to show that. Um, I may look. Be at, sure to look for dog man print, not track. Yeah, I did look for print, and and I got a bunch of posters and and like things to put on your wall. Um, when I did Google that. I don't see one currently, but I'll tell you what, I'll look at it as we're listening to some of the audio that we're going to play here. Um, which one would you like to dive into first, the Dogman one, Vic? Sure, that sounds good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Vic has graciously, graciously brought, brought us one of uh, his encounter video, uh, audios from his show, and this is a, a person's testimony uh, as to what they experienced, so... Buckle up, and uh, for those of you sensitive folks, you might want to mute it. I'm just saying. But we're going to go to that. Uh, This is about 16 minutes long, so we'll be right back after this. Well, I'll try to put you right with me as much as I can. Like I said, the dogman subject is such an anomaly of sorts that in my remembering these two encounters, you know, they were enough. But I don't want to have another one, but I'm not going to stop going out into the woods. But the first one took place on the reservation. My grandfather had horses, and I would periodically take them out one at a time to get some country on them so they won't be so green broke. And he had a a neighbor that was a rancher, and some of his cows were missing, so he asked me to saddle up and go find them. So I did. I sat up and told my grandpa the direction I was going, and I took off. I had to cross a creek, a little river, little creek. I had the best horse for that. I always had different horses for different things, but this horse would go through that creek, no no problem. It was up to his belly, but we got into the bank of it, and I was looking around up and down. There's brush down the bottom, a lot of ash and cottonwood, hardwoods along with cedar, you know, the softwood, pine tree. But I was getting ready to cross, and my horse stopped and looked off to the right. Like, he, you know, he just, he would sense things better than me. And as we got into the creek, we were right in the middle of the creek. All of a sudden, he stops. And he's looking to the right again. There's, there's all this brush there. He's looking to the right, right? And he's, his head would drop like he's really trying to peer into that brush. There's something there. His ears were forward, and I can feel it under the saddle. He started to tremble. Something was scaring him. But he tried to move, and I, I pulled down the reins, and he stopped. But he, and then he kept looking, peering into that brush, and I was looking. And then his nostrils flared, and his head went up like he smelled something bad. And so I waited just a couple of seconds and the breeze blew again. I could smell it. It was, it, it stunk. So as I was looking into the brush, I stood up in the stirrups and looked over the top of the brush there and heard 
I see two ears. And I so what the heck? That brush had to be 10 feet tall. I could see these ears, and I realized, wait, that's one ear. And as it kept turning its head, that was that was the other ear. That's, I've seen two ears. But what I felt it was doing, first of all, is I didn't label it a dogman right at that moment. But I looked at my horse again. You always got to trust your horse if there's any horse riders out there. They'll tell you what's around. But I looked at him, and he, he was trembling, and his ears were just shaking, poor thing. I said, I got to get out of here, whatever that is. But as I started to move, he wouldn't move. He was like standing in cement, kept looking over to that brush. So then his whole body turned to face it. So I knew that this was not a good place to be when he had felt the need to turn his whole body to face whatever it was. And so I finally got him out of the water and we stood on the bank and that's when we both saw it. There's this thing running, kind of almost trying to parallel us, but I stopped, but it kept running. You could see the ears, the one side of the ear, it was going up and down. But I thought that has to be tall if, those, if that brush was almost 10 feet tall. And the way I measure things is like a basketball goal. They're 10 feet from the ground. And it was moving. I mean, it was moving. My horse... I, I, I swear I was going to faint because it kind of got a little unsteady. And so I turned it around and we went, followed the creek the other way. Went straight back to the corral. Put my horse in, rubbed it down, curry combed it a little bit, and gave it some oats and a little bit of water. He didn't move from that spot for two days. He did not move. He stayed right in that spot of the corral. I went down a second day to see him. And he just stayed there. I gave him some water, gave him some hay, but whatever it was, and I'm sure it was a dogman now because of certain things, but how it affected my horse. He didn't move for two days. He just stood stock still in that in the corner of that corral. And finally, on the third day, he went out of the corral, but he got with the other horses right away. He wouldn't leave them. He stayed with them. Well, whatever this thing was, like I said, I'm sure it was a dogman that it um it had an effect on my horse greatly, almost gravely. I thought he was going to die. So in my mind, though, as much as I was trying to see what, what I was looking, trying to look at what I was seeing, I was more concerned about my horse of how he was acting. He was a great horse, a good horse. So. That was the encounter there that I had. I approached a couple older men in the community, but as soon as I mentioned dogmen, they politely excuse themselves. So I've had a lot of, you know, many different kinds of experiences down where I lived. But like I said, I, I didn't want to mention them to any of my family, you know, for fear of something happening to them when I'm not around. Or because I'm around, something's going to happen to him. So I kept a lot of this inside me. So now, like I said, this is not lit for this. Therapeutic, so to speak. And maybe I can help somebody out there in this by saying, don't think in you're brave and strong and go looking for these things. Because you'll find them or they'll find you. I'm sure there's things that happen out there that are covered up. And, you know, like the government covering up UFO sightings. You know, I'm sure locals or, or maybe state governments, whatever, hear about this stuff. I'm sure law enforcement hears about it because they'll probably get called. There's something in my backyard. Come look. You know, but the cover-ups. But for me, don't go out there. Even if you're armed, don't do it. You might end up shooting somebody or yourself or maybe even a dog man and getting him upset. So my second one happened in the Black Hills. I'll say that, the Black Hills here in South Dakota. I worked for the forestry, U.S. forestry. One of my first 
paying jobs, my first paying gigs, as they say. And I worked with the Youth Conservation Corps, YCC. We met at headquarters in town, and we would go up in the hills, go to our various workplaces. And one of our work sites was what they called the Flume Trail. It was a trail from Hot Springs all the way up to Deadwood. If you're familiar with Deadwood, you know, the gambling place. But it was the Flume Trail. And they had a bunch of Chinese immigrants make this trail. They cut into rock, granite rock, various conditions. They worked. But they would make tunnels here and there to go through rather than have them go up or around. They'd just make a tunnel. But it wasn't a very big tunnel. You had to almost bend over to go through it, but you'll make it. But we came up upon one tunnel. And normally, we could almost see the other side with, you know, the light if we, during the day. But this time we couldn't. It was all dark all the way through. So, of course, me being a young guy, and they asked me and two other girls to go check the tunnel out to make sure it's clean and clear. So at that time, once again, I was not aware of Dogman. I was aware of Bigfoot, but not Dogman. But as we got into the beginning, I turned my flashlight on, and one of the other coworkers had a flashlight. So we started to go through. We had helmets on, hard hats on. And as we walked through, there was water, of course, you know, in some areas of, of the tunnel. But as we stepped into some of the water, oh, geez, probably 10 feet away, there was splashing. Something took some steps. It wasn't running. It just took some steps. So the girls got a little concerned. I said, no, I think it's a deer. But I didn't think so. I just said that to calm them because what steps sounded like was something heavy. Something big made those, those three steps. So as we, we took tentatively more steps in, in, into the tunnel, we realized it was a lot longer tunnel than, than what was said. But once again, two steps, big, heavy steps. And this time, one of the girls thought they heard like, like, a, like a growl, like a slight growl. And I was in lead, so I wanted to be big and strong and brave. But inside, I was, oh, my God, I'm going to die. But we went closer, and this time, the steps taken were towards us. And one of the girls took off back out the tunnel, told them there's something in there. And so one of, the, one of the leaders came in, and the other girl took off back, and then me and the leader kept going. We had our strong flashlight, so we kept going. And finally, as we were getting ready to turn this little corner, because the, the tunnel wasn't straight, it was kind of like a, a, you know, just a slight horseshoe shape. But he stops and almost stops breathing. And as I'm telling you guys this, I'm feeling it right now. Just, my body's just shivering. He he's, he's almost stops breathing, points. And what we saw first were eyes, of course. The redness of these eyes, the red glow. And it was a huge hulking figure. At first, we thought it was a wolf or something because it was bent down because the cave was small and it was huge. But I looked with my flashlight and it was different. We should have been able to see every part of this thing with the flashlights. But we couldn't i we saw the eyes he said he saw the shoulders and the neck which he said had to have been three feet wide maybe four but he said it looked like it had dog paws but it was on its two feet had tail but as we were able to i i him and i don't know what it was but we started to get closer to it rather quickly maybe it was doing that to us i don't know but we lost our 
our fear or maybe we were just numb, but we tried to get closer to this thing and it turned. And within three steps, it was out on the other end. So we thought, well, someone should be able to see it on that end. Because some of the workers were going over the tunnel. But it ran out. And me and the boss stood there for a little bit, barely breathing. I mean, I was taking deep breaths. It just, I couldn't breathe. Not because of the, the closeness of the tunnel, but whatever this was, it affected me that way. And my boss looked at me and he told me, we didn't see anything. There was nothing in here. So I, of course, I, okay. But later on, I, I knew that that probably wasn't right. That would was what you would call a, a cover-up. To report it would have been a big thing. To have it believed, even a bigger thing. You'd have to really do some talking, and I'm not ready to be called crazy or, or whatever like they do. I believe that's a, lot of, that's a big reason why a lot of people don't talk about them so much. That too, because... Of ridicule. So, anyway, we got back, got out the other side, him and I walked out, but I looked around on, and there were wet tracks on the dry dirt. The dirt was pretty rocky, it had dirt on, but it was covering rock, granite rock. So, there wasn't so much making a sinking track in it, but the dust was disturbed enough to show the outline of the track, and it was wet. It was huge, very narrow in the heel wider in the paws but it took off and and when we got out there were people just coming over the hill so they wouldn't have seen it but it had a long trail to run to get out of there so i think about that it still concerns me to this day scares me to this day and that happened years ago I remember that day, I really worked hard so that I would not keep my mind on it. But when I got home, I went down to my room, and uh, I'm sorry to admit this, but I went down to my room and I cried. I didn't want that memory in my head, seeing this thing. I didn't want that memory in my head, but it was there. It's like they say, sometimes there are things you can't unsee. That was one of them for me. So now as more of it comes out, information on it, that I thought, well, geez, you know, these girls could have been hurt. We do exude an amount of fear, and some animals could pick up on that. So that happened been with me all these years i forget about it i'd push it down and i'd remember forget about it push it down but i feel this is the time to talk about this with vic and his outlet it's just more than telling stories it's very therapeutic for those telling the stories it's almost ptsd type of stuff so anyways i would not want to take that word away from the valor that our servicemen go through and what they get when they come home. But that would be a form for me though. Well, I'll try to put you right with me as much. Wow. That was incredible. That's amazing. I mean, uh, you're hearing a person who obviously is a, a kind of a salt of the earth guy. It sounds like he had a, you know, a full lifetime of experience. But in these two instances, he saw something that was so incredibly profound and poignant that it changed everything. That's incredible. And just think, somehow, some way, he's supposed to go to work and function and do what he needs to do and whatnot after having an experience like that or experiences like that. That's yeah. That's just beyond the scope of of understanding. And, and it, it, it's one thing to just sit here and, and think about what he saw. But I mean, for him, that's, that's as real as it gets. I mean, he was there and, and had this presence so close to him 
uh, you know, maybe probably two different presences, but still, and one of them in a tunnel. I can't imagine a worse place to run into something like this where your only options are forward or back, you know? Oh, no doubt. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. It's not just that. It's not just the fact that these eyewitnesses have to get up the next Monday morning and head into work. Mm -hmm. Their fathers, their mothers, well, yeah. the kids, they don't care what you've been exposed to. You still have to be their parents. So yeah. Yeah, it's so hard for a lot of these people to continue and function the way they are required to in day-to-day -day life. So it's just really a shame when they have these experiences that just knocks them off the tracks the way these encounters often do. Right. So that's, that's just something that it's all too easy to lose sight of, but it's all part of it. Right. Now, here is the photo, ladies and gentlemen, of that print that Vic was referencing. Um, there's the shotgun shell in there as well. And, and my God, that's, that's scary big. Well, they get bigger than that. Really? I, I, yeah, I've seen them as big as dinner plates. Oh, my God. Wow, that is incredible. You know, you think about a shotgun shell. A shotgun shell is anywhere from two and three quarters of an inch long to three inches long. And uh, looking at that, you know, you're going you're gonna to say that's easily nine inches from, from the top to the bottom mm -hmm. of the print. So, yeah, that's huge. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> you know, I knew I was, I was expecting, uh, I was expecting a big print, but you know, when you see it showcased in this way, it's like, yeah, I'm just, if I saw this on the ground, I'd be like, nope, I'm going home now. You know, I'm not going to steer and look around. I'm just done. That's it. <laughs> Man, these people, and they get to, they get to live with that. So very powerful, uh, story, very powerful encounter um man i'm just blown away now somebody in the chat had said do you think it was uh, rachel one of our mods said do you think it could have been like the scent that shook the horse up initially or do you think it was maybe an infrasound kind of thing or what was it did the horse actually see the thing or, or what was your take on that vic i'm sorry the horse yeah, in the first part of that story, the, the guy had the horse, and he said his horse just never behaved the same way after that for quite a while. Oh, I see. Talking about the encounter. Yeah. Yeah, I think the horse could probably smell it, okay. or it might have been emitting infrasound also. It's hard to say. All we can do is guess on that, but sure. I wouldn't be surprised either way. No, that's a great question. Are they known to possibly produce infrasound too? Well, I'm not going to say that they're known to do that the okay. way Sasquatch are, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility that they can do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, of course, other things that create infrasound. I think whales do, uh, tigers, elephants, and even like some atmospheric disturbances create infrasound waves and stuff and cause problems. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously represented in the natural world. And uh, <laughs> if, if they can do anything, I, I bet you they could do that too. I mean, I, I don't put anything past these things, but man, that's absolutely shocking. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, I know. And the, the, the other part of it is, is that, you know, when you talk to a person like that, Vic, you can hear it in his voice. You can hear him reliving that experience. It's, it's just... It's not, I mean, there's, if you can walk away from that and not think this man has obviously suffered a great deal from this experience, you, you've, you'd have to be completely devoid of any, any reason because <laughs> right. that man was still shook and it was so many years later. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, it's all too easy to focus on the entertainment side of things. Most right. people listen to the shows for the entertainment value that they get from it. The next scare. That's why people can't look away from a wreck. There's an entertainment value to that. But please don't lose sight of the fact that there are victims behind each and every encounter that have been affected and who knows what ways. So I always tell people, please keep that in mind. Yeah. And would you say, Vic, that, that in many cases and hearing many, many Sasquatch reports through the years, um, it seems as though for, for the majority of the cases, the Sasquatch chooses to be seen. You know, it seems like 
for whatever reasons, and we can't pretend to, to know for sure, but um, they seem to make themselves uh, readily visible and available uh, for certain cases. And it may be because somebody's too close to a young one or something and, and they're trying to draw them away or whatever. But um, would you say that that is the same for dogmen in your experience? Well, with dogmen, it's different because in a lot of cases with dogmen, they try to make the eyewitness think that they're going to be killed, eaten, killed, you name oh, it. Yeah. They're not going to do that to them. Mm-hmm. Well, in some rare cases, they probably do. But in most cases, they are just doing what they're doing to try and give that impression. Okay, these are the last moments of your life. I'm going to dispatch you. But they don't want to do that, of course. But with Sasquatch, yeah, they might let you see them, but they don't normally give you the impression that they're out to kill you, that they're going to wipe you off the face of the map. So it's similar in ways, but it's still fairly different. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the, the ferociousness or the tenacity of the of the dogman encounters are are what always blows me away. And and you know, when I first started learning about it, I was like, I was already you know shook up enough just to think of there were Bigfoot out there. <laughs> but when I learned about dogman, I was like, <laughs> yep. oh my god, really? Yep, you know, yep. they're there too. Go home, Fido. <laughs> what do you do? Throw a stick? What do you do? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I just think it's it's so incredible. And I guess probably in in my journey through the whole paranormal, that's been the one takeaway that I've just boggled my mind is that there's so many things out there we just don't understand. Oh, no doubt. That's the worst part. If dogmen are out there, if Sasquatch are out there, then what else is? Right. right. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, you know, uh, you know, there's been some a lot of um, 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 uh, oh gosh, where did that word go? Uh, s- speculation about how and and where um, you know the, the, a Bigfoot might live. You know, do are they are they nomadic? Do they move with the 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 um, changes of the season? Do they follow the the mm-hmm. herds of of animals? You know. Um, Do they roam or do they stay in one place? You know, um, in general, um, coyotes around here, we have coyotes year round. We have wolf as well, Um, you know, but they do range away, you know, a ways away occasionally. Um, But for the most part, they're always around, you know, during winter, especially the coyotes around here. My goodness, I don't think they ever go anywhere. Do, uh, is there any speculation on do... Uh, dogmen live in packs, you know, or are they, are they sedentary, uh, not sedentary, but, um, solitary, um, solitary. Yes. Thank you. Um, cause we know they're not sedentary. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, are they, do they live in packs or groups or things like that? Or, or are they all singles and, and roguish? Well, when you think about the daily caloric requirements of a dogman, that's seven feet tall, a small one. If you think about that and how many animals in a particular area would be required to sate that need, right. it really wouldn't make any sense to have them living in groups because that's just going to make a, a problem that much worse. Think about how many deer and other animals would be required to feed four dogmen right. for any period of time. So that's why I tell people that I'm pretty much convinced that they try to live in they try to live by themselves for the most part, unless they come together to breed or for whatever reason. But, yeah, that right there would make really good sense. Uh, that's a, a very good reason, in my opinion, mm-hmm. that makes me think that they don't normally come together in, in living groups. There have been credible eyewitnesses, like I said earlier, who reported seeing groups of them together. But, yeah, I think they, they might come together at times, but I don't think they stay together for very long. But think about it. Wolves, they... They live in packs because the game they dispatch requires their numbers to take out. Mm -hmm. They require, it takes numbers of them to take down elk because of speed. Mm -hmm. They relay, they run relays Mm -hmm. to tire out the elk. And if they're in areas where they can lay traps and things like that, then their numbers are beneficial that way as well. But when they take down the game that they hunt, on a regular basis, yes, it takes numbers of them 
to do that. Sure. But with dog men, a dog man can dispatch anything it comes across. <laughs> it can kill a bison. It can kill anything that it it wants to take down. So there's no need to to live in groups or anything like that. It's just basically a hindrance if they do have more than one in a particular area. I think that also a single dog man living in this area over here, it's going to have a huge home range that it's going to move around in so it doesn't deplete all the resources in any one particular area in its home range the same way the mountain lions do, the same way brown bears do. It just makes sense. That's why I think they do that. Ah, yeah. Good point. Now, the other the other takeaway, I guess, I would I would be curious about is that let's say they're Sasquatch in an area and then there's a dog man in the area. Can they... Would you imagine they could coexist. share and coexist in that space, or do you think that they tend to be territorial towards each other? Well, there have been several credible people over the years who have reported seeing Sasquatch and Dogman coexisting, but the information seems to point to the idea that that's the exception rather than the rule. Okay. What the numbers normally point towards is the idea that once dogmen come into an area that's occupied by a Sasquatch or a group of Sasquatch, the Sasquatch head for the high country. Mm -hmm. Because these guys normally seem to mix like oil and water. Mm -hmm. Normally, if they're living fairly close to one another, there's a geographic barrier between them. Uh, a geological barrier between the Sasquatch and the dogmen, like a river or something like that, to keep them apart, to kind of separate their territories. But sometimes dogmen just do come into areas where Sasquatch are, are living, and when that happens, normally people who are living there or spending a lot of time there will tell you that the Sasquatch just disappear. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, I often wonder, I guess, you know, it's the kid in me. It's like the Bigfoot versus Godzilla, which one would win. And I, I, I don't pretend to know because I think they're probably both, both very capable of, of defending themselves and protecting themselves. But I, I imagine that the claws would be, would definitely be a, a more of a problem, you know, when you got razor sharp claws on both your feet and your hands, a you know, a mouthful of very large canine teeth. <laughs> right. And then the strength and speed as well. So I don't know. I mean, I, I guess if I was the Squatch, I'd move out too. It's like, they can, they can have it. We're done. Yeah, yeah, we'll see you next summer. Come on, kids, we're moving. <laughs> we're packing up. We're snowbirding it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you just, uh, why would, and, and why would they want to invite the confrontation that would leave either both or one of them maimed? And, and then, you know, it's a death sentence for anything in the wild to be injured. So right. they probably would avoid it, I would imagine. Wow. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, those claws are a form of a ranged weapon. They don't have to grab. They can slash yeah. at a distance. As long as that claw can scratch you, then they've accomplished the damage. Whereas with a Sasquatch, it has to grab and then cause blunt force trauma or, mm. or whatnot. So, yeah, I think that is an advantage. I'm not going to say that dogmen would necessarily have an easy time taking out Sasquatch or that they can reliably beat a Sasquatch, but... Mm. It does make you wonder. It does, yeah. I mean, you know, and then there's, I, I don't know, we could talk about it all night. Oh, the Sasquatch throw rocks and they could take them out ranged. I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's one of those things that I think animals generally try to avoid confrontation with each other, especially large apex type uh, animals because, you know, with the, with any kind of injury is a death sentence there or could definitely be uh, a huge hindrance in the wild because they can't just go to urgent care and get it, <laughs> get it sorted out. It's, right. they got to heal through it. So that would be tough, but, oh, I'm sorry, Vic, were you going to say something? Oh no, you're fine. Okay. I was going to, I was going to say, we got the second clip here and this has to do with your Bigfoot uh, sightings and uh, let's, let's listen to that now. All right, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to listen to this, so buckle up and uh, get your popcorn ready. This one's going to be good. My Bigfoot sighting started at the ripe age of 14, so that would be exactly 10 years ago as of this year. And what I didn't know then, but I've come to know now, and as I will soon explain, the first encounter actually led to my full acceptance into what is an actual tribe of Sasquatch that people tend to think are just animals, but they're not. 
But at 14, I was out back in the blackberry bushes about 50 yards behind the house. And at the time, I had my first service dog, Shadow. And we were back there having a good old time picking blackberries, eating most of them. But we did try to save some. And then off to my east into what was called the big woods of the neighbors, I heard two tree knocks. At the time, I had seen the Finding Bigfoot shows, so I knew what a tree knock was. Me being 14 and dumb, picked up a stick and let an old cedar stump have it with two big knocks. Well, another two knocks came from the east. Then one came from the west. And then two came from the south. And all I could take that as was, well, I'm here where y'all, my knock started. One over to the west, well, I'm here. One to the south, well, I'm over here. Then I heard the knocks again to the east. And you could almost tell it was like, well, then who the heck is to the north? Not even five minutes go by, and I could hear it in the thicket behind the blackberry bushes. Crunch, 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 stopping about 10 feet away from me. Now, I mean, it's it's thicker than thick back in there, and you, you can't see nothing. But I could tell by the hairs on the back of my neck that there was something staring at me. Well, I kid you not, when I say me and the dog hightailed it out of there, we hightailed it out of there. So I'm sitting there texting my best friend, calling her on the phone. Oh, my God, I just... I swear there's a Bigfoot over here, man. I did a, I did a tree knock, and, and, and it's coming after me. And I just don't know what's going on. She's all freaking out because she's seen them too, and she's all, I guess, happy. I'm not because this thing's a little too close for comfort. So I make a run back to the house, taking the long route through our five-acre field. And that was, that was about all that, you know, had happened there for a while. Well, that all changed the hunting season of 2018 in December. What happened in December would make most people quit hunting. For me, it just made me stay out of one particular spread of woods. So this is approximately the 6th of December. We are out of rifle season, but before muzzleloader. My mom's horse had just been put down the day before, and I went out hunting going in the woods to take my mind off of it because Romeo was a good old boy. So I go off onto my neighbor's property. We're getting a little, little desperate for meat. It was hard times and we were just, you were running out. So I get up in that property and I hit that deer trail. It was an overcast day, rather cloudy. It was about four in the afternoon and the wind was kind of gusting through the popples. So I'm weaseling my way up this hillside, going up this pine trail, this little deer trail, hoping maybe, you know, I'll catch one on the way down. I got the wind in my face. Life's all good. Now, the gear I'm carrying is a crossbow that goes 300 and I believe it's 15 feet per second. So 315 FPS. Ain't bad for a crossbow, but it ain't good. So we're weaseling up this hill, and I'm getting to the top of the track, and I finally get up to this top clearing right in front of a big grand of pines. And something just tells me, A, I'm in trouble, and B, I need to look to my right. So I look to my right, and the first thing I see is a wall of brown. Stand up, turn around, start walking away. And another mass going right in front of it. Now, it took me a hot minute to realize what I just seen. But what I saw is exactly as I'm now going to tell you. I saw a 12-foot tall male Sasquatch. And when I say he is built to the hilt, I mean built to the hilt. Take a 55-gallon drum, put a bunch of fur on it, and give it legs. And that's, that's the big one. That's who I now call Big Chief. The second mass was more of a blonde. Just as big. Now that I look back on it, she was probably pregnant. 
about 10 foot tall female. Neither one were happy that I was there. Both had me dead to rights at 15 feet, not 15 yards, 15 feet. That's a little too close if you want to ask most people. So I'm freaking out. Okay. I've got two over thousand pound animals sitting there walking away from me. And I got a crossbow that fires one shot at a time with 165 pound drawback that I can't pull back unless I have the rope pull, which I left at home. And now I got to get out of here. Okay. Well, I can run back down the deer trail and probably break my leg over the deadfall. Well, then I'm just dead anyway. Or I can cut through these very dark pines and which way these animals had just moved. Pardon me, I just said animals even though they are not. So I went through these pines and I went absolutely stealth. I went military style, man. Absolutely watching my six, watching my front, keeping a look to my nine and three. And I get out to the power line. Now, normally, I take that power line back up to the house. It's a good quarter of a mile walk. But something told me that if I take the power line, I was going to be dead. So I went the extra 50 feet to the road. And I climbed to that far side of the road. And I walked that embankment with my bow pointed right at them woods. I was scared to death. Then I had to round the corner and walk the other quarter of a mile back home. And get back in the house. Now, normally, mama would know that when I go out hunting, I'm not back till dark. Well, it is now 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It's nowhere near dark. I come in. I put the bow back in its case. I sit down. And I'm white as a sheep. You all right, honey? What'd you see? I didn't see nothing. And I just ignored every question she wanted to throw at me. Now, that encounter shook me up to the point where I didn't want to hunt for a while. So about a week later, I'm sitting there in my own house, in my kitchen, with my mom, and we're talking. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. I look up to see the female Sasquatch walk five feet in front of our front door. And at this time, my other shepherd, Smokey, is outside in the kennel, pushed up as far against the wall as he can get, staring, scared out of his wits. My mom asked me, did something just go in front of the door? Yeah. You know what it was? Yeah, mama, but I'd rather not say. Oh, it was a Bigfoot, wasn't it? Ha, yeah, okay. Because at the time, I didn't tell my mom about anything. She wasn't a believer in Sasquatch just yet. So I didn't tell her what it was, and she's grabbing me because, oh, I, I saw Bigfoot. Well, I didn't deny it, and I didn't agree. So a little bit of time passes, and a couple of months go by, and I came clean to my mom about what had happened and what I saw. She got to thinking about it. And she says, no, thinking back on it, you did act a little bit funny that day. So I finally got my mama to understand what was going on. Now we're back into the February time period of about 2019. Mm, 2020, not 2019. 2019 was actually a relatively quiet year for me, thank God. 2020 kicks in February. And... A lot of my friends who came over, they were reporting seeing shadows darting everywhere across the road. So we're back into, you know, we're in February and me being me, I decide to go camping out by the field with our horses. I figure, you know, it's a warm February. I'm going to go camping. So I'm out there and it's just one of them off nights. You know, when you're sitting at home and all of a sudden you kind of get that hair in the back of your neck feeling like, you know, just something's really off outside. Well, I'm out there in the tent and it's about one o'clock in the morning. And down the road by the corner, I hear, and then nothing. 15 minutes later comes by, a little bit closer. And finally, the third and final whistle I heard 
was across the street from my tent at about 30 yards. And what really got my attention was I heard a stick crack. That was too close. Me and the dog lit out of that tent, shotgun in hand, and we were running for the house. I was not hanging around. Something was coming up through there, and there's only one thing I know that whistles and can crack a stick. So the next morning, I go out there to about where I thought I heard it. Lo and behold, I found the stick dead center of a 16-inch track. So now I'm freaked out, man. I was like, oh, my God, I've got a footprint of a squatch, and it is here, and it was that close, and I could have died. That's what's going through my mind. Knowing now, no, there wasn't no danger. So give it about another month. Now we're in March, and I'm out target practicing with a 22 because I want to go squirrel hunting. So I'm shooting, and I'm shooting, and I'm shooting, and finally I just give up because my scope's off and the iron sights are bad, and I had enough. So I'm getting ready to walk back to the house, and I have this feeling, look over your left shoulder, and I look. And this is the first time that I've ever seen the face of these things, but it has not been the last. Standing eight feet up in the trees in between these pines is this black face looking at me. Now, there's no mistaking what it was. It had the conical top of the head. You could see the brow ridge with the dark brown eyes. You get to the nose, it's a little bit flatter, kind of like a, a African-American's nose where it's kind of pushed in. But then right below it, you get a little bit of gray around the mouth and down the chin. There's a big gap between the nose and the mouth, as often as reported. And he's just standing there. And you can see his shoulders through them trees. And pines ain't hiding him very well. And I look, and it scared the daylights out of me. So I said, okay, I'm going to the house. So I go up to the house and I say, hey, mama, there's a squatch back there in the trees. And he kind of looked at me a little funny. He says, well, I know your twin cousin's been coming over. Has she been making you feel off? And I said, yeah, she's just around all the time and I'm just feeling off. Well, maybe that's why they're coming around, kid. Yeah, mama, you probably got a point. So time goes through. And we get into the summer of last year, about May or June. And I'm sitting there with my mama on the deck. And she's always going on about how she wanted to see one of these things. You know, I, I just want to see one. I just, I want to, I want to know. And I told her, mom, you don't realize how big these things are until you see them. Well, I, I still would like to see them. Man, I just kind of wonder, you know, maybe they're across the street looking at me. And I said, well, I know for a fact they're across the street looking at us because I'm looking right at one right now. Same face that I saw in March. I said, Mom, he's back. What? Where? So I show my mama, and she starts to flip out. And I said, okay, Mama, don't panic. But there's another one. This one was not black. The second one was a chocolate brown, lower to the ground, and had a chocolate brown and lighter brown face, identical to the first one, but set lower. I said, Mama, there's a second one right there. So that encounter I actually got to share with my mom, and she got to see her first ever Sasquatch. She saw two of them that day. And they were probably about 30 yards from where we were standing. So this is where I'm kind of thinking, and I've realized now that there's a much bigger tribe in the area than I originally thought. Because about two weeks later, I'm going to do chores, and it's about five, six o'clock at night, and I'm going out with my hay wagon, and it squeaks something god awful. And we still use it. But I'm going down the road to get to the back side of the pen, and I look over, and there it is. This little blonde. Sasquatch, about five feet tall, just looking at me. So I look at it. It's looking at me, probably thinking it's hiding or something. And I do an up nod, like, what's up? And I just keep going. I've gotten so used to these guys around that it's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, you're over there. Hi to hell, good neighbor. And this thing, his eyes get about as big as saucepans, drops its mouth, turns around, and hightails it. 
Well, I could only imagine what the conversation was that it had with his mama. It probably said, Mama, I saw that funny looking thing that they're always saying they always see. Mama, it was weird looking. I could just, you could hear it now. So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, cool. You know, that's, that's the first really small one that I've ever seen. But had I known then what I know now, I would have known that uh, they're actually a lot smaller when they're really little. Because not even two days later, that blonde colored mama that I had seen on the encounter in 2018 was standing five feet from the horse pen when I was out doing chores in the morning. And when I say that she was holding the cutest little thing I've ever seen, I mean it. This thing was probably about the size of an average human toddler. And it was brown. About the same color as my mama, or as its mama. And they're just staring, sitting there staring at me. So I stare, you know, I kind of look at them a little bit. And then I go back to doing my chores. And about five minutes later, I look back and it's gone. Well, after about that, the actual physical sightings kind of went down. But we've heard the hoops and the hollers. We've heard the wood knocking. And we've heard them moving around. And they actually (laughs) came around the house as soon as we started building our new house. They started coming around and wandering around. Now, like I said in the beginning, these things are a tribe. These are people. I am a quarter Navajo. I'm also 116th White Mountain Apache and 116th Ojibwe. The Anishinaabe culture calls these the Masabe, which means the guardians of the water. Most tribes will call them the big brothers. And that is what I refer to these guys as. Now, I didn't know it then, but I've had these things bluff charge me out of the woods before. I've come back a few days later and standing right over top of my track, this bear track. I've had a couple where there was coyote tracks across it. I even had one where there was a mountain lion track right in my step. So these things shoot me out of an area to keep me away from large predators. Now, if they don't give a rep about you, they ain't going to do that. But if they actually care, and a lot of these ones will and they do, especially if they've gotten to know you and watch you grow up. They watched me grow up out in these woods running around like a yahoo since I was really little. And I have a good rapport with them. No, I do not gift. I do not feed them. If anything... If I know there's a bad storm coming in that's going to be coming in later in the day, I'll go to what I call what we have as a designated meeting place and I'll let them know what's coming in or what the weather's going to end up doing. And if anything, we exchange crystallized stones, the, the stones, the quartz crystals and other really cool crystals. We will exchange those. I'll set one down and I'll come back a few days later and the one that I put down is gone but a different one has been set down. It's an exchange. I'm a rock hound. They like their crystals. And it's, it's just kind of a happy thing. I can count on them if I need them. I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt, if I came into some trouble around here and I was loud enough, I'd have them here no problem. So those are my Bigfoot sightings, my Bigfoot encounters. And people just need to be aware. Not all of them are good. There are some that are not good. Not all will be friendly. I have been fortunate enough to have the friendly ones around me. Are they friendly to everybody? No. But they seem to like me and my family. And hey, that's just fine with me. So those are my encounters. And I'm sure I'll have more. And I look forward to the rest of these encounters that I'll have throughout my lifetime. My Bigfoot sighting started at the right. Wow. Wow is right. That's intense. Those are kind of, those are the, the kind of stories that it's the, for lack of a better term, it's the orgy of evidence. It's, it's a lot of things happening for one person, but there, there's historical accounts of uh, first nations trading with them uh, to some degree. And I don't know, I, I don't know that they were like uh, whipping out mats and and we woven rugs and stuff, but she's also talking about trading. So it's kind of interesting that maybe some of those traditions carry on with specific individuals. 
I don't know. I don't know what to think of yeah, that. It does make you wonder. Yeah, I mean, what do you think of that, Vic? I mean, with a, with a story that's... And she seems like a wonderful person, and I, I'm not... I'm not casting doubt or uh, any kind of uh, criticism at it. It's just she certainly has experienced a lot, and I'm on the outside looking in just listening to a clip, but it, it sounds really profoundly almost like a nurturing relationship, right? Well, I don't understand it, but there are people who just have encounter after encounter after encounter. It's really hard to wrap your head around. But there are people out there like that. I don't know what it is about them, but it seems like Sasquatch are just drawn to these people. Now, there are a lot of charlatans out there who claim to have all these experiences that don't have them. But I'm not the one to be able to definitively say this person's full of it, this person's legit. All you can do is just use your instincts, and yeah. and that's about all you can do. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, some people, they definitely do. Mm-hmm. I've had people send me evidence to prove that yeah i do have all these experiences so some of these people who claim to have all these repetitive encounters do have them yeah and it's it's kind of neat to know that there there is a a potential and i i don't mean to speak uh you know all flowery and pie in the sky and stuff but there is a potential to have i don't know if it's an arrangement an agreement or a uh some some form of of uh, you know, relationship with them. And I, and I think that that's, if that is indeed true, and I, I'm not saying it isn't, it cer- certainly could be. I think that's kind of beautiful, you know? It can be. You have some people who appease them. They gift them. Mm-hmm. And everything's great while they're doing that. But when they stop, it, the wheel rolls off. So <laughs> what starts out as beautiful and amicable doesn't always end that way. Right. Mm. Yeah, that's the other side of it. And of course, we've all heard those those horror stories as well. And and some people were gifting unintentionally, like uh, they, they had like uh, oats in the barn, and and they noticed their oats going down fast, so they moved them. And then suddenly, <laughs> they've got Sasquatch raging all over because they can't get to the oats anymore, and and they didn't know they were getting in the oats. Um, I've heard a bunch of those stories through the years. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. There have been people who don't want to gift them, but they start gifting because they want to appease them, get them to stop doing things they don't want them to do. They've been going after their livestock or doing this, doing that. Well, I wonder if I gift them, give them food every day. I wonder if that'll stop it. Well, in some cases it does. But now you're a prisoner because if you stop gifting them the food, then the wheel's going to roll right back off. So it's... It's really not fixing anything. You're just buying time, basically. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's really cool. Um, I, I, di- I did think about, as she was talking about, the size of them, and I, and I think that's probably one of the reasons that they stay hidden so well is because it's hard to conceptualize what that size looks like in person. I mean, it's it's one thing to think, oh, eight feet, oh, okay, you know, and you you... You would think that, oh, that, that it would stick out even more, but I just don't think our brains are, are hardwired to see that, you know? Oh, definitely. Think about the fact that a basketball backboard, the top of it, a regulation backboard, like in the NBA, is 13 feet off the ground. Mm-hmm. Now, come down a foot and imagine something that tall. Just oh. It just blows your mind. Right. right. Yeah, I, I know. When we were at the, we were at Squatch Fest, which is a festival over here. Uh, it was over in Kelso, um, Washington, right, Don? Yep, yep. And, and they had a, a, an eight-foot uh, Sasquatch out there as a statue, and I went and stood by it, and I was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> it was like the first chance that I'd ever had to really conceptualize what that would be like to come face-to-face with something. This is a statue. And, and just imagining that being a living, moving, breathing thing that could, you know, stomp you into pudding in a, you know, in a fraction of a second, it's just a whole different game. Oh, it is. And like you said, that's an eight footer. Yeah. Imagine adding, imagine adding four feet to that. <laughs> just, yeah. That's just crazy. <laughs> it really is. That's a bin and it's just well, amazing. You know, and it sounded like she had a realistic expectation of what exactly she was seeing too. Because she did mention, you know, that, that uh, you know, this thing was, this creature was 
uh, 12 foot tall, you know, and, and the other one, uh, the blonde one, she said was like 10 foot tall, but she did refer to them as, well, you know, they are thousand pound, thousand pound, uh, uh, creatures, you know, so, you know, they do, you know, she did have a real, you know, because she's a hunter, I gathered, she was a hunter to, to begin with. So she would understand the idea that just because, uh, the the idea of the cube squared like we talked about earlier so oh yeah definitely she's spent a lifetime out in the woods and those distances measurements so yeah if she says 10 feet tall 12 feet tall i believe her i don't think she is just throwing a number out there i think she knows what 10 feet looks like she knows what 12 feet would look like so i believe her yeah, and I, I thought it was neat when she was talking about the bluff charges and that they were, you know, at the time she didn't understand, but when she went back out there, she saw tracks of something else out there and it was actually a protective mechanism, right. which I, I just thought, man, that is, that's really amazing, you know, that they, that they had such a, such a regard for her or, you know, as a protective quality uh right. to their relationship and that's i guess if you got them on the team you're you're you're, you're doing okay good. <laughs> you're doing pretty good exactly <laughs> oh yeah yeah i've heard about them protecting families before there was one lady who had drug dealers come onto her property and oh. the sasquatch saved her from a, d- a drug dealer that found her one day hiding behind a tree watching them so yeah they started coming the drug dealers started coming for her and Oh dear. Uh, Sasquatch, they came in and saved the day. So, oh my God. Yeah, it can be beneficial. Wow, is, yeah. is that on one of your episodes? I'd love to hear Check the full out. version of that. That's amazing. No, that's not on a, oh, okay. a show. Dang. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like an awesome story. I'd love to hear that. But uh, uh, I, I just, it's just the, the problem with having you on, Vic, is that two hours it's just goes time. way too quick. <laughs> 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 well, thank you. Well, it's it's been an epic journey, of course, and uh, I, I just want to first and foremost thank you for being here, but I want to make sure you have enough time to let people know how to keep up with what you're doing. So would you mind doing that? Well, thanks for the opportunity. If you want to listen to episodes of Dogman Encounters, there are two ways you can do that. You can go to your favorite podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify, you name it. You name the podcast app and you can find Dogman Encounters. If you want to listen via YouTube, then just do a search for the name. If you type in Dogman, then that should be the first result that pops up. And then as far as my new Bigfoot show called My Bigfoot Sighting goes, you can listen to that using your favorite podcast app as well. Or you can listen via YouTube. Just type in My Bigfoot Sighting on YouTube and it'll pop right up for you in the same, obviously on your favorite podcast app for my new paranormal show called my paranormal experience. If you use your, if you want to listen to that as of right now, it's only available on YouTube. So just go on to YouTube and search for my paranormal experience, <clears throat> excuse me. And then for Bigfoot eyewitness radio, <clears throat> To listen to that, it's only available in podcast format. So if you go to your favorite podcast platform and search for Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, you can find it that way. Obviously, you're taking over the world. <laughs> yeah. Not even slowly. I'm from it, but I've got my share of podcasts out there. Yeah, you do. you got you got a pretty big footprint yourself there, mister. Uh, <laughs> See what I did? That was, thank you. <laughs> I'm here good. all night. I'm here all night, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, we're just about out of time. But uh, once again, Vic, thank you so much. It's been a, a rare pleasure, and and please come back again and and uh, regale us with more of this incredible information. Well, it's been a great time. Anytime you want me back, then yeah, just let me know. All right, and thank all of you for being here. Uh, I, I realize there's some new names in the in the chat. Thank you so much for coming in, stopping in, checking it out, and being a part of the journey. Uh, we hope that you'll get subscribed and uh, f- keep following what we're doing here on the portal. We do live shows on YouTube every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday nights. So uh, we hope that you'll continue to come back and be a part of what we're up to. And, of course, check out Vic's shows. Uh, you obviously won't be disappointed uh, as you just got a little sample tonight. And, uh, you know, there's so much more on his on his uh, catalogs of uh, in his body of work. So check it out. And, Don, good to see you, brother. Hey, thank you. Nice to always be here. 
Absolutely. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I guess that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. Thanks again. Uh, Don, anything in closing? Uh, no. Uh, we did just get the, uh, the uh, merch shelf down oh. below um, uh, on YouTube. So uh, as you're watching the show, if you want to peruse that, uh, our merch is just right below the the uh, the video there the you know the you know the pop up whatever anyhow <laughs> so but there's that so don't forget you know uh, paranormal portal gear get that you won't be um, um, uh, you won't be satisfied until you do <laughs> <laughs> and Vic did you want to say anything in closing sir no just thanks again for having me on and it's been a great time. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap it up for us. So remember, we love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other, help each other out. Find the magic in every day. And remember to laugh as much as you can. We'll be back on Friday night for another two-hour fun fest of the paranormal and then Saturday again. So hope you'll check it out and check out our podcast. It's available on all the platforms as well. So lots of paranormal goodness all around. Um, and, and Vic, if you'd hold on to uh, Skype just for a few minutes while I close this up, and then we'll chat a little more. We'll do. All right, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>